Why did God create us? What was his plan? What was his purpose? What was his reason for for putting us in this world? That is a question that that many people have asked over time. What was his plan? What was his purpose? What is what is his reason for for me being in the world? That is something that we're going to be taking a look at here in our study this week. Our study this week is going to be the first study in a brand new series of studies that I'm doing here in the month of March as we are going to be making our way, making a journey to the cross, we are going to be doing that by taking a look at some pivotal moments that we will find in scripture that points to our need for the cross. It points to our need, in other words, for Jesus, for Jesus dying on the cross, becoming our propitiation. And so I want to thank all of you for joining me for this week's study I want to thank all of you who have been with me throughout this season of studies. I hope that you have enjoyed each of the studies that we have had this this season. I know that I have enjoyed sharing them with all of you. So what we're going to do here for today, uh, we're going to focus in on scripture that is going to come from the book of Genesis. We're going to take a look at scripture that will come from the first, the second, and the third chapter of the book of Genesis. I'm going to announce the scripture that we're going to be focusing in on as we go throughout our study here this week. And and as I often say, I'm going to cross-reference scripture as well. So certainly be ready to turn in your Bibles with me as I reference those scriptures so that you can see it for yourself. And, And as I would often recommend, I hope that as you go along with me, Within this study that you are jotting, that you are taking down notes so that you can go over it again with yourself for yourself after we are done here with this study, taking notes again, trying to understand everything that we go over here in our study this week. So we're going to start off here in our study today by taking a look at again that question. What was God's plan for us? Why did God make us? Why did he create us? What was his reason? What was his purpose? Again, what was his plan? Many of us, we think about that question and we think about how we live in the world today. We think about what it is that we do here in the world today. We we worship the Lord. We praise the Lord. We pray to him. We do those things. And so many in, in answering that question, they would say, well, God, he created us to, to worship him. He created us to, to praise him. He created us uh, to pray to him. He created us to honor him. He created us to, to love him, is what many of us would say. We would think in, in our mind, some, some believe in their head that, that God, he needs us. Someone I've uh, seen the other day uh, suggested that that God needs us to love him. They said, oh, poor guy, begging for love. They mocked the Lord. Is that true? Does God need us uh, for us to love him? Does God need us to, to praise him? Does the Lord need us to pray to him? Does the Lord need us to worship him? What do you think about that? My thoughts on that to suggest that that the Lord needs us, it would suggest that God is weak in a, in, in a, in a manner of thought, right? It would devalue the Lord. You know, it, it would suggest that, that we have something that we can give to the Lord that would actually help the Lord out in a manner of speaking, right? You know, for example, I need, I need you, you need me. We need each other to help each other out, to to lift each other up. We are supposed to love one another, right? And we are supposed to help each other. Not everyone does that. A lot of people are selfish. They say, I don't need you for anything, right? And so they, they go about life doing their own thing without anyone ever helping them with anything. And we find that that living that way can can be a great struggle, right? So does God need us in a manner to help him? What is it that we can actually offer the Lord that will help him? There's nothing that we can offer the Lord that would help him. So what I would say to anyone that would say God needs us, he needs us to love him. God needs us to pray to him. God needs us to worship him. God needs us to to praise him. I would say to them that you don't know what you're talking about. If you really believe that, 
your your thoughts on this matter, they are of ignorance. You lack understanding in what you are saying. You lack understanding in what you know of the Lord because God does not need us. Okay, I hope you heard me loud and clear there. God, he does not need us. God, he does not need our praise. God, he does not need our honor. God does not need our worship. God, he does not need our love. Now, that may come as a shock to many people. Many people may begin to look at me and they may look at me with a confused look on their face. They'll say, what well, pastor, what in the world are you talking about? Or, Have you lost your mind? Have you gone mad? Have you gone crazy? To, to speak on this, I would recommend that you turn over to the 19th chapter of Luke and take a look at the 40th verse. In the 19th chapter of Luke's gospel, there's a lot that is, that is shared in, in that chapter of Luke's gospel, but the triumphant entry of Jesus going into Jerusalem for that last week of his life, it is recorded in that scripture. And what we know about the triumphant entry is that when he entered into Jerusalem for that last time, the scripture, it shows us that that his followers, his disciples, and I'm not talking about the 12, I'm talking about all of those that, that sincerely believed in him, they were singing out praises to Christ. They were chanting his name. And I want you to understand that they weren't doing that from, from a place of mechanical religion. They were doing it because they wanted to do it. They were doing it because they, they sincerely loved the Lord. See, there were many over in the sixth chapter of John's gospel, as it is recorded, there were many that had turned away from Jesus when, when he said that he was the bread uh, from heaven, that he was the bread of life. And he said, Hey, eat of, eat of me, uh, come to me and you will never hunger. You will never thirst again. There were many that they, they could not understand that. And, and they turned away from Jesus. But those who remained, they were there because of sincere faith, at least most of them, not Judas Iscariot. He was just there to be there, right? But again, many of them, they loved Jesus and they sang out praises. And what you find in that 40th verse that I referenced is that the religious leaders, they despised Jesus and they despised the fact that the people were singing out praises to Jesus. And they, they, the religious leaders, they cried out to Jesus, hey, tell your folks to stop. Tell your folks to shut up. Tell your disciples to keep quiet from, from praising you like you God. And so when they said that Jesus, he turned to the religious leaders and he said, hey, if if they were to keep silent, if if I were to shut them up, to keep them from from showing me love, to keep them from from praising me, if they didn't do it, these rocks, they would cry out. What does that tell you? Jesus, the Lord, does not need our love. The Lord does not need our praise. His creation, if, if we weren't present, if we did not love him, if we did not praise him, his creation would cry out. And so on, on that note, for all of those that say, well, God, he created us to serve him. What do you think the angels, what do you think that they do? They are entirely different beings that, that were created by the Lord. And they have their own purpose. The, the angels, their purpose is to serve. They, their purpose is to, to move according to God's will, to, to work. They are messengers. Every time we see them through, throughout scripture, they are carrying out the will of God. That was the purpose that God created them for. So for us to understand our purpose, we have to take a look at scripture to find the reason why it is that God created us to find out the purpose that God created us for. And so what I want you to do now is take a look at the first chapter of Genesis. And we're going to take a look at scripture that runs from the 26th verse down through the, the 29th verse. You know what? What I'll do is I'll stop at the 28th verse. I'll tackle the 29th and the 30th verse in a moment. I want to initially read here the 26th through the 28th verse. So I hope that you have that open because now we get to see why it is that God made us. Now we get to see the reason, the purpose 
behind uh, our creation. We're told there in the 26th verse, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so we're told that in the 27th verse, it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. 28 verse says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So do you see it there? Do you see the reason, the purpose as to why it was that that God created mankind? If you don't see it, we'll we'll go over this. We'll take a look at it. But it begins there in the 26th verse, where again, we're told there that, that God, he made man in his image according to his likeness. A lot of times when, when we take a look at that scripture, we get hung up on whether or not we we literally look like the Lord. There are many people that will argue whether or not we look like God. I believe that the scripture is very plain and clear on whether or not we look like God. And so I personally, I don't get hung up on that. It's, it's not a concern to me. There's a lot more depth here going beyond whether or not we look like God. We, we, Let's not get hung up on that. Let's let's eat the meat. Let, let's dig into to what is meant here in this scripture, that the fact that we are created in the image of God, the fact that we are created in his likeness. And then we're told there in that 26th verse where the Lord said, let them have dominion. He said dominion over the fish, over the birds, over the air, uh, the over the cattle. He said over all the earth. I, I think about how God is. God, he is sovereign over everything, over all of creation, all things that are known, all things that are unknown. He created all of it, the things that we can see, the things that are invisible to our eyes, the things that we are unable to see, the things that we know, the things that we don't know. The Lord, he He rules over all of it. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere at all times. He's all-powerful. He is the Almighty. And then, God, he created this world, this, this specific world that we are in today. He created us to have dominion over it. So, in a manner of speaking, we are like replicas of the Lord where God, he gave to us the ability to think. We are self-conscious. We, we are aware that we are living. We are aware of life. Along with those, the, along that same line is the fact that, that we have morality. We can discern what is good and, and what is evil. And of course, a lot of times that is a subjective, right? But we can determine when, when an action, when it affects someone, we can, we can determine if our actions is uplifting, if it is helping someone or if it's hurting someone. And, and again, we, we make a choice as to whether we are going to help, whether we are going to uplift. We, we make a choice whether we are going to not care, whether we are going to tear down. That is a conscience choice. I don't care what anyone says. It is a conscience choice. We have morality and that separates us from, from everything else in this world. We, we, we truly are unique in being the image of God and being created in his likeness. And so on that note, when we take a look at the, the 28th verse there, we can again see the purpose, the reason as to why God made us, why he created us. And we're told there in the 28th verse, the scripture says, then God blessed them. That's talking about mankind. The scripture says, God said to them, be fruitful. God said to them, multiply. God said to them, mankind, 
fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So simply put, God created us to live. Nowhere do we see in that scripture where God created us to serve him. We don't see in that scripture where where God created us to, to pray. We don't see anything like that in that scripture. The Lord said, be fruitful. The Lord said, multiply. And, and there's a manner in which we were supposed to live in, which again, it is shown to us there when we take a look at the 29th verse. If you take a look at this whole chapter, at least as well, but there in the 29th verse, we'll see where the scripture says, God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you. It shall be for food. And then it says there in the 30th, the 30th verse says also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is light. I have given every green herb for food and it was so. God, when when he created this world, I want you to understand that he did not create this world from a place of hatred. He did not create this world from a place of despair, even. God, he created all of this. He created it out of love. So he created a world where man initially had no need for for anything. The world, it was furnished. It was fully furnished. Man, at the point in time, didn't even go hungry. But man could eat. And so when we take a look at that 28th verse there, and again, we combine it with what we see here from the 26th verse down through that 30th verse there, we should understand that God, the intent, the reason why he created us was for mankind to live in the abundance of the life that he gave us. We were supposed to live in the abundance of life. We were supposed to live in the same love that he had because, again, he created us. We are replicas, like I said, of him. So that love, it was within us. God, he created us to be holy and righteous. He didn't create sinners. And so if we are the image and the likeness of the Lord, God, he created us to live peacefully. That was the intent. That was the reason. That was the purpose as to why God created us to live in the abundance of of his life that he gave to us that he breathed into our nostrils and we were supposed to live in peace. We were supposed to live out of love. We were supposed to live in harmony with each other. And then again, he said, be fruitful and multiply. We were supposed to prosper in this world. We were supposed to fill the earth. And guess what we were supposed to fill the earth with? We were supposed to fill the earth with love. We were supposed to fill the earth with love. That was what we were supposed to do. But we know what happened, don't we? Let's turn over now to the second chapter of Genesis. And what I want to do here in the second chapter of Genesis is I want to take a look there at the the pivotal moment. It begins there in the 17th verse. We're there in the 17th verse. We'll see where God, he gave his his one and only instruction to mankind in order for mankind uh, to live in the abundance of of life that was given by God. We're told there in the second chapter of Genesis and the 17th verse says, I take the 16th verse. I'll lead in with the 16th verse says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat there in the 17th verse says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord commanded, you shall not eat. For in that day, the Lord warned that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this is where the pivotal moment begins. As I said, do you do you see why? Do you know why this is where the pivotal moment begins? Because, again, we, we have seen where God created us. He created mankind in his image and in his likeness. 
We were not created to be sinners, as I said. We were created in holiness and righteousness. We, again, had the image, the likeness of, of the Lord. That is what we were created in. But again, we see here in this verse, the pivotal moment begins with God giving instruction to mankind. And so the question now arises, will God, or will man, I should say, Will man be obedient to God's instructions? Could man keep this, what I would say, this simple instruction? Could man simply not eat from this one particular tree that was in the garden? This is why this is why this moment becomes so pivotal in the garden. Because, again, there is a choice here. Obey, disobey. Eat from the tree or not eat from the tree? What did mankind do? Again, we know the story. If we if we take a look at the third chapter of Genesis, we'll see there in the sixth verse. The scripture reads, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. This moment, it is so pivotal. It is so crucial because what we see in this one verse is what, what all of us face in the world today. Again, I point out that Eve had a choice here. Adam also had a choice here. I am not going to excuse Adam from anything. Many people like to try to, to always put the blame on Eve and Eve alone, but she is not the one, the, the, the only one that disobeyed God in the garden that day. I want you to understand this moment. It is so pivotal, pivotal, pivotal because God, he gave us his instructions. He gave mankind instructions. The first instructions that, that man had ever received from the Lord. And look at what mankind did. The same thing that we do in the world today. Eve, she was tempted by this tree. Yes, again, the devil pushed, encouraged, right? Tried to influence, tried to persuade, right? But again, take a look at that verse, okay? Look at the, the decisions that, that Eve is making here, knowing, okay, if you, again, look at that first through the fifth verse, you will see where Eve knew that she was not supposed to eat fruit from that tree. But when we take a look there at that sixth verse, he saw that the tree was good for food. She is being tempted by the tree. She could have ate from anything else in the garden. Man, we, we read the scripture there in the first chapter of Genesis where the Lord filled the earth with all green herb that, that, that man could have wanted, ate from. But the one particular tree, the Lord instructed, don't eat from it. And here Eve is admiring, lusting after the fruit of that tree. And it says that she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. She is being tempted here by this tree. And so we know when it comes to temptation that we should not give in to temptation. Temptation, it is always pulling us away from the Lord. It is always pulling us to sin. It is always pulling us to disobey. But, but we often lose that fight against temptation, don't we? And, and we see here that he, she lost that fight. She, she, we don't necessarily see her put up a fight. And, and I don't think that many of us, we, we may think that we were putting up a fight, but a lot of times we cave into temptation right away. So she saw that it was pleasant to her eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She wanted to be wise. Eve wasn't happy with, with you know, she wasn't content with what she had in the garden. She, again, desired to, to be wise. And so she took of his fruit and ate. And then she also gave it to her husband, who ate as well. And so, like I said, we try to, to put all of the blame on Eve. But again, I want you to understand that Eve not Eve Eve had a choice. Adam also had a choice. 
and could have easily. We don't see it at all here in the scripture where Adam asked Eve, hey, where, where did you get this fruit from? You know, it, it, nothing at all, you know, that Adam asked to, to try and prevent himself from, from disobeying the Lord. I guess you could say, well, you know, some would say, well, you know, he's just trusting his wife. You know, he's just trusting Eve. But again, they both disobeyed. They both disobeyed the Lord there. Okay, and, and we'll see there in the seven verse says that their eyes, it said, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They they knew that they were naked. Their eyes were open. And, you know, a lot of times we, we think about their their physical eyes being open. Uh, we think about their nakedness being that they realize, hey, since their eyes were now open, that they saw each other uh, naked. But I often, when, when I talk about this moment, it is so pivotal because mankind lost the holiness and the righteousness of the Lord. They, they lost that, that image and that likeness of God. God is holy. God is righteous. He is, you know, in all of his glory, right? And man once had that, but that shed away due to sin, due to disobedience. And so, yes, they realized that, that they were naked. They, they had lost their glory. And so because they were now corrupted by sin, we take a look there at the 24th verse where the Lord drove out man from the garden. They were exiled from, from the garden. And then we'll see that God placed cherubim at the east of the garden. He placed the flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve, they weren't allowed to get back into the garden. And the reason why they weren't allowed to get back into that garden was because the garden was supposed to be a, a holy and a righteous place. When, when I think about the world in its initial stages, when, when the Lord created this world and, and he, he put mankind into this world in that garden, I truly believe that God had created a heaven for, for mankind to be in. Because again, the Lord desired to dwell with mankind. He desired for, for mankind to, to dwell in his abundance to dwell in peace, to dwell in joy, to, to need for, for nothing. To me, that sounds like heaven. To where there aren't any aches, there aren't any pains, there aren't any worries, there's no stress, right? There, there will be no need of, of anything. That's what scripture tells us. And so again, there in the garden, we see where all of that was essentially thrown away by Adam and Eve because they chose to disobey in the pivotal moment where God gave them instructions and they disobeyed. When, when they disobeyed, as my dad would say, all things just started to change. After the third chapter of the book of Genesis, things changed. We run into the fourth chapter of Genesis where in the fourth chapter of Genesis, you'll see where, where Cain murdered Abel. He did that out of spite. You get over to the sixth chapter of Genesis, and, and you'll see where, where the world was, was so wicked that the Lord desired to just get rid of, of man in the world because of mankind's wickedness polluting the world. The Lord, the scripture says there in the third verse, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Then we'll see there, if you happen to take a look there in the sixth chapter of Genesis, and you take a look at the sixth verse there, where the scripture will always see that the Lord was, was sorry that he made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart, the scripture tells us there. And then we'll see there in the seventh verse where the Lord he said that he would destroy man whom he had created from the face of the earth. And again, all of this, it points back. It points back to the garden, to that, that pivotal, to that crucial moment in the garden where Adam and Eve, they received instructions from the Lord 
and they blatantly chose to disobey those instructions. Sin, it, it poured out into the world when, when Adam and Eve, when they were pushed out of the garden. And, and, and sin began to affect the world. Death began to creep into the world. Death, there was no such thing as death in the garden. But, but man, again, man was once incorruptible. We were created in the image and the likeness of God. But sin, disobedience, because, because what was once incorruptible to become corruptible. And so our flesh, it, it, it could be torn away. Our flesh could be cut. We could bleed, right? Man, when man was in the garden, if you think about it again, if we take a look at the, the second chapter of Genesis once again there, we'll see there in that scripture, uh, in the 18th verse, in the 19th verse as well, we'll see where before sin, man was living in harmony. Man was living in harmony with the Lord before sin. We'll see there in the 18th verse, the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. You see, Adam, I don't think Adam, when he was in the garden, realized that he was even alone. He didn't know necessarily what alone was. He, he Again, he was with God. And so Adam, he didn't have to pray to God about anything in the garden. He had no need for anything. Again, we saw it in the first chapter of Genesis. The Lord filled the earth. And so Adam had no need for anything. He didn't hunger. He didn't thirst. He ate just for joy, for pleasure. Again, he was living in the abundance of life that God had gave to him, a life that was of peace, a life that was of joy, a life, in other words, that was of contentment. And so there in the 18th verse, we see where God saw fit to give man a helper. You know, we often like to, to make it out that, that Adam and Eve were gardeners. But Adam and Eve, they didn't have to till the earth. They weren't gardeners in the sense that we think of gardeners, right? Gardeners, that's, that's a hard living to go out and, and, and have to, to form and, and do things like that, right? Adam and Eve didn't have to do that. They didn't have to do that at all. In fact, again, if you take a look at that, that 19th verse there, the scripture says there, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. The Lord, he was creating, he was doing these things and he kicked back, you know, he kind of kicked back and he, he was watching what Adam would do. The Lord and Adam, they were enjoying themselves. They were living in harmony. They were living in love. They were living in fellowship. Adam didn't think he had need for anything. But again, the Lord saw fit to give to Adam out of love. Because again, the Lord saw for man to be fruitful and to multiply, to prosper in the world. And so he gave Adam Eve for them to grow, for them to prosper together, for them to live in love, for them to live in peace. That was the initial desire for the Lord, for, for, for man to live in the abundance of the life that God had given to them. But then again, when we turn over to the third chapter of Genesis, We'll see that in the scripture that after sin, after they were pushed out of the garden, man had to get to work. Man had to labor. The scripture, it says there in the 23rd verse, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So like I said, when man was living in the garden, there was no struggle. Life was easy. It, it, it truly was a pleasure. All they had to do was just live in the abundance of life. They had no need for anything. But once God pushed them out of the garden, Adam had to get to work. 
his belly would begin to growl. He would have to work to, to feed himself. Eve would have to get to work to feed herself. And just think about how we live in the world today. And we go out and many folks grind and they hustle. They grind and they hustle hard. They, they work hard to, to earn a living. I, I think about my dad and the life that he lived, how hard he worked. And as soon as he retired from working, he passed away. He didn't even get to enjoy the, the fruits of his labor in the world. And, and I think about what, what Solomon shared in the book of Proverbs when he just said all of it is vanity when you choose to live a life without the Lord. It is meaningless, is what Solomon said. I think about all that was thrown away in the garden. Most importantly, when we take a look at the third chapter of Genesis, when we think about this pivotal moment, and of course, again, we're thinking about what was lost as far as the aspects of, of living an easy life, I want to touch on what was lost again between the relationship between mankind and the Lord. Because again, over in the second chapter of Genesis, we, we saw this moment of, of harmony, of, of peace between man and, and the Lord. Again, that's what God desired, right? He, he desired for, for us to live in the abundance of life, to, to live in fellowship with him, to be content, to live having need of nothing. But when we take a look there at the eighth and the ninth verse there, we'll see how sour the relationship it became after Adam and Eve chose to disobey in the garden. We'll see there in the eighth verse, the scripture it reads, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then there in the ninth verse, the scripture says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now, there are two things there that I want you to notice. I want you to pay close attention to here. First off there in the eighth verse, we see mention of the sound of the Lord God moving, walking in the garden. I believe that the Lord was always moving. I believe that the Lord was always walking in the garden. I, I don't believe uh, this is anything special here that is mentioned in the eighth verse. Because again, when we took a look over in the second chapter uh, of this book, we saw where the Lord was clearly present in the garden. So I don't think that there's anything special about that being mentioned there in the eighth verse. I believe that this is mentioned in the eighth verse because the Lord's presence, them hearing the sound of him move in the garden, it caused Adam and Eve to dread the Lord. They fear the Lord. Why is it that they were now all of a sudden afraid of the Lord? Where again, before in the second chapter of Genesis in the scripture that we read there, Adam didn't fear the Lord. Adam was just having a, a, a good time, you know, living again in the abundance of life. He didn't have, he didn't have any worry. He didn't have any fear, but all of a sudden after blatantly, after choosing to disobey God, all of a sudden we see where Adam, he fears the Lord here. There's no more harmony at all. No more harmony is present here. You know, when, when, when two live in harmony, it should just be in sync, out in the open, comfortable, right? And, and that's where I believe that Adam and, and Eve were with the Lord at one point in time in the garden. And so when we take a look there at the ninth verse, where we see there in the ninth verse that the Lord called out to Adam and said, where are you? Don't, Take that to mean that somehow God was searching hard up and down all over the place for, for Adam and Eve. Don't, again, don't devalue the fact that the Lord is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Don't, don't do that. Okay. What, what I take that scripture to mean there is that 
This is the first time to where God had to call for Adam. He never had to call for Adam before. Because again, they lived in harmony. Adam never hid himself from the Lord. Adam Adam was always out in the open. I believe Adam and Eve were both out in the open. They never tried to hide from the Lord. But here, sin, sin caused them to hide. So again, that moment, again, it is so pivotal because again, when we think of ourselves today, how many of us we try to hide? How many of us try to cover up our sins from the Lord? Many of us, we we have skeletons in, in our closet that, that we don't want those skeletons to get out. We don't want nobody to know of those skeletons. We try to keep those skeletons from the Lord as well. How can we hide anything from the Lord? How can we hide ourselves from the Lord? There's no hiding from God. You can hide things from, from me. You can hide things from from your best friend, from your family as well, but you can't hide anything from the Lord. This again, I, I, I point out because it shows just how crucial the moment of choosing to, to disobey God was for man, because now there's no harmony between man and the Lord. Over in the book of Isaiah, over in the 59th chapter of Isaiah, when you take a look at the first and the second verse there, you will see where sin, that is iniquity, as the scripture says there, where it caused separation between God and mankind. The scripture reads, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. God is fully able. God is fully able to save. His hand is not shortened. The scripture says there, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. The Lord, he can clearly hear. God, I want you to understand, he's not hard of hearing. Again, the Lord, he knows exactly what you are going through. He knew exactly what Adam and Eve, what they would face. He knew what they would go through. We'll see there in the second verse, this is what happens. This is Part of the consequence of sin here. We're there in the second verse. The scripture says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We we don't understand the the consequence of choosing to blatantly disregard the Lord, of choosing to blatantly disobey God. Many of us, again, like I said today, we scoff, we mock the Lord, we therefore scoff and mock the idea of being in fellowship with the Lord. We make, therefore, light of sin and the consequence of sin. The consequence of sin is that sin, it raises a barrier between us and the Lord. Those who choose to sin willfully today, there is a barrier between them and God to where if one who chooses to blatantly disregard the Lord, they can't cry out to him. They won't cry out to him. And the reason why they won't cry out to him is because they don't believe in him in the first place. We need God. We need him in in our life in order for us to be able to make it in this world that is of sin in a world that is, again, constantly tearing away at us, not simply tearing away at our flesh, but tearing away at at our soul, at our spirit. Something that you you often hear me say is that we are more than, than our flesh. We are more than flesh and blood. We are more than even the color of our skin. We are spiritual beings. And in order for our soul, in order for our spirit to be content, to be satisfied, we need God. We need him in our life. And so in order for us to to go to God, that barrier, that wall, that wall that blocks us, that separates us from the Lord, it must come down. It has to come down. In order for us to be able to talk to the Lord, we have to, to get rid of that barrier. And I want you to understand that we cannot get rid of that barrier by our own strength. We cannot get rid of that barrier 
by our own power. We can't get rid of that barrier by our own might. And so again, that's that's what this, this moment here, that's what it shows us. It shows us that, that we are fully capable of disobeying the Lord. But we also see here in this moment to where we need help. We need to get back into harmony with the Lord in order for us to be able to make it. And so the pivotal moment, it leads to the scripture there in the 14th and the 15th verse. Where there in the 14th and the 15th verse, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. There in the 15th verse, the scripture says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we see there in, in both of those verses, something that again, it comes from a result of the pivotal moment to where we see that the Lord, he is talking to the serpent. He's talking to the devil here and he is promising. He is making a promise to the devil that will come through the seed of the woman. Now, if you take a look there at the 15th verse, you will notice there in the 15th verse about her seed, the S N seed there in my Bible, it is capitalized that that signifies here that we're speaking of one who is holy. We're speaking of one who is divine. This is a reference to Christ. This is essentially the first mention here to where the result of the pivotal moment here. It again, it points ahead. It points to, again, our need for help. It points to our need for assistance. It points to our help coming from the Lord, our help coming from the Lord in the form of one who will be born into this world. That is Christ who was born in the flesh, God in the flesh. Therefore, the defeat of Satan, it points to the cross. And that's what we're on our journey towards. We're on our journey towards the cross. So we see the result here of this pivotal moment is a moment that points ahead to Christ. Now, there are some who say, well, Jesus, he he was God's plan B. Now, I want you to understand something, that Jesus was not God's plan B. A lot of people, they look at what happened in the garden as a setback for the Lord and and his plan for for mankind. But God doesn't have setbacks. You know, when when we have setbacks, we we get so down, we some of us we would just flat out quit. But the Lord, of course, he did not quit. God, he does not have a plan A, he does not have a plan B. He just simply has the plan. That plan still remains today for mankind to dwell with him, for mankind to live in harmony with the Lord. That plan, again, goes back to what we see there in the first chapter of Genesis, again, there in the 28th verse, where the scripture said, again, God said to mankind, be fruitful and multiply. Over in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah and the 11th verse, we see where the Lord says, my thoughts towards you, they are of peace. They are not evil. My thoughts towards you, my desires, they are of a future. They are of a hope. What is that future? What is that hope? That again, man be fruitful, that man multiply, that we, in other words, live in the abundance of the Lord. And so over in the 14th chapter of the book of John, Jesus said that he is preparing a new place for for us, for all of us who are of sincere faith, for all of us to dwell in. God has not created some new plan in Jesus. Jesus is not a plan B. There is no plan A. There is no plan B. To suggest that Jesus is a plan B, it again will undervalue the Lord. It will make God out to seem like he's a fool when he is holy and righteous. God is no fool. God is not ignorant. And so we we should never say anything like, well, Jesus, he's God's plan B because God had a setback. It would suggest that the devil defeated the Lord. 
No, God didn't defeat the, uh, I'm sorry, the devil didn't defeat the Lord. So we can still be fruitful. We can still multiply, right? We can still live in harmony with the Lord. We can still become holy and righteous. For, for us, sin is a setback. Sin is a struggle. That's for us. It's not a setback. It is not a struggle for the Lord. And so, again, all of this here in this pivotal moment that we have studied here for today, it all points to our need for Christ. So I hope you understand that God, even though we we pray to the Lord today, mankind wasn't necessarily created to pray. You don't see man pray uh, in the Bible until you get to the fourth chapter of Genesis. After Cain murdered Abel. At the end of the fourth chapter of Genesis, that's that's the first time that you see man began to call on the Lord. Because in the, in, the, in the first few chapters, when, when man was in the garden, we had no need of anything. We didn't need anything. We, we saw where, where God knew our needs and, and would move on, on, on our behalf. He moved for Adam. He gave Adam Eve without Adam ever asking for Eve. And so today, the Lord, he, he knows our needs. But again, we have to go to God today. We have to show, right, that we are of, of faith. We, we have to be of faith. We have to lean on. We have to depend on the Lord. We, we must move by, by sincere faith. All because of the pivotal moment that occurred there in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, where Adam and Eve, where they chose to blatantly disobey the instructions that God gave them in the second chapter of Genesis. Okay. All right, so I hope that you enjoyed this study. I hope that you were able to learn something from this study, that you were able to take something away from this study. And I hope that, again, you can apply something that you heard here today, apply it to yourself, that it can, can dwell in you, that it can grow in you, that you can, again, be fruitful, that you can bear fruit that is holy and righteous. All right, so I hope that you'll come back for our study next week where we're going to take another look uh, at, at a pivotal moment in scripture. We're going to be taking a look at Abraham in our study next week. And again, I certainly hope that all of you will come back for, for that study. I hope that all of you will share this study with someone somewhere as well. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.